Straight ahead on CCX News, a mysterious box of letters found in the attic. We're just blown away by the, the extent of the collection. What it reveals about the history of Robbinsdale. Plus, a big social event involving tiny fish continues, but without the man who started it decades ago. But first, local lawmakers weigh in on the latest effort involving gun legislation at the Capitol. CCX News starts right now. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us. The contentious debate over gun restrictions has reached the floor of the Minnesota House, but not in the way that some lawmakers would prefer. Now, two bills related to gun control have been tabled by leadership in the State House, and as Delane Cleveland explains, that's prompted a day-long protest. Just outside the doors of the House chambers, dozens of people in favor of stronger restrictions on guns gathered to make their voices heard. Be the hero. But inside the House chambers, a group of lawmakers were making noise in a different way. It's going. My butt is sore. My spirits are high. Erin May Quaid is a state representative from Apple Valley. At the moment of this interview, she was 22 hours into a 24-hour sit-in. It was her way of protesting the fact that House leadership have not allowed debates or votes on two bills related to gun control. I'm not a member of the majority party. I am not a member of the Public Safety Committee. There's not a lot I can do, but I can do this, and that's why I'm doing this. Dozens of fellow lawmakers joined her periodically throughout the sit-in, including Representative Mike Freiberg of Golden Valley. I'm supporting my colleague. I mean, it's drawing attention to the issue. I feel like the more pressure there is on the House leadership to at least have a vote on this issue, the more likely it will occur. One bill at the heart of this sit-in would require background checks on all firearm sales. We represent. A recent Star Tribune poll suggested that 90% of Minnesotans support this idea. And it just seems to make sense to me that we should be able to have a vote um, on the House floor on something that is supported by 90% of Minnesotans. Yet the fact remains that the Republican majority gets to decide which bills receive a vote on the House floor. These lawmakers hope this sit-in helps encourage House leaders to change their mind. We still have four weeks in the session, so there's still time where this could happen. This afternoon, I spoke to Republican lawmaker Dennis Smith of Maple Grove. He said his party wants to focus on bills related to a larger safety discussion involving guns, such as those bolstering school security and mental health services. Meanwhile, the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus argues that criminals are already circumventing the current background check process to acquire firearms, and adding additional layers to that is only going to affect law-abiding citizens. A gun owner's rally is planned for Saturday. Alex. Thanks, Delane. The Yasio School Board has appointed a former member to fill a vacant position on the school board. Dean Henke was chosen to fill the seat vacated when Robert Gerhard resigned earlier this year. Henke previously served on the board for 13 years, including five as board chairperson. He will formally take office on June 5th. A former Plymouth City official faces federal charges in an illegal bribery and kickback scheme. The U.S. Attorney's Office has filed one count of wire fraud against Ronnie Taggart. Taggart worked as facility supervisor for Plymouth until November 2016. Prosecutors say in a four-year period, Taggart received $58,000 in bribes and kickbacks in exchange for city contracts. Some of that came in the form of work at his home. Prosecutors say Taggart encouraged contractors to inflate the amount of their bids to cover the cost of kickbacks. And the city issued a written statement saying it discovered the financial irregularities in 2016 and reported it to authorities. They also say city employees value the trust the public places in them and appreciates their responsibility to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. In other news, a fast-growing lighting company is practicing what it preaches with a new state-of-the-art facility. The new headquarters of Energy Management Collaborative features all LED lighting designed by their employees, as well as control systems that can change the color of the light, and motion sensors and auto-dimming help save energy and money, too. The company works with some of the largest businesses and retailers in the country to change out old technology in favor of LED lights.
LED lighting is uh, much brighter. It can be a better environment for their, their guests or their shoppers. Uh, it runs cooler, so you get HVAC savings as well. So there's a lot of intangible benefits with LED lighting as well. The CEO expects to see a 70 to 75 percent energy savings with their new facility. Historians in Robbinsdale have a treasure trove on their hands and a little bit of a mystery, too. A collection of letters and memorabilia from the founding family, the Robbins family, has been found in a Plymouth townhouse. As Shannon Slatten reports, historians have no idea how they got there. Every birthday celebration needs gifts. So it's fitting that on Robbinsdale's 125th, historians got a mysterious present. She remembered that her daughter had found boxes of letters in the attic a number of years before and that they were of this family. And she just said, would we like to see them? Someone found boxes of letters, school papers, programs, photos, and more, all from the family of Andrew B. Robbins, the man who founded Robbinsdale. There's a little mystery to it because how they ended up in this townhouse in the attic in Plymouth we, we don't know. The, the house was built in the 70s. We, we're still sorting that out. But the letters and memorabilia are a treasure trove that historians are still sorting through. We were just blown away by the, the extent of the collection. It's about 100 years of correspondence going back all the way to the 1860s with the Civil War and the Dakota conflict. Not only are there letters from the Civil War, but many are from his daughters. Here's a, a poem that Edith Robbins wrote called Suffrage Salad. Who were women ahead of their time. The women uh, did a lot for building this town. Uh, Edith Robbins served on the school board for 25 years, and there's a poem in here she wrote sort of tongue-in-cheek about why women shouldn't have the right to vote. There's overseas correspondence from Amy Robbins, who worked for the Red Cross in France during World War one and came back to own her own business. There's a long letter from Amy Robbins where she describes the businesses that were failing and the bank that was failing in about 1919. There are also fun bits about life in Robbinsdale. Esther Robbins, pictured here with her dogs, wrote a diary about them. There's a lot of personal information and there's a lot that's that's really interesting about the history of the city too. Historians are still digging through the boxes and scanning documents, curious to see what else they can discover. It's an astounding collection uh, and it you know means a lot to the history of our city and, and I think sure it means a lot to the to the family and their descendants. In Robbinsdale, Shannon Slatten, CCX News. Wow. Well, still ahead on CCX News, a standout student who wants to go where no man has gone before. You'll meet him coming up. Plus, hear from the new Park Center head football coach. But first, even though clouds are expected on Thursday, it will be comfortable. Highs around 60. Well, here's a big question. What do you want to do with your life? The high school students in the Robbinsdale School District got a chance to interview professionals and explore career possibilities. They will um, ask questions like what the job skills are, what the um, education requirements are, do they like their jobs. Professionals representing the fields of real estate, software development, police and fire, and even broadcast journalism were in the hot seat answering questions from Highview students. 20-year-old Jake Ripley came back to his alma mater to share his story. Three years ago, he planned to drop out of high school, but thanks to some tough love from his teacher and a tour of Hennepin Tech College. He discovered the field of fluid power and hydraulics. Now he's on track to earn three degrees and he's doing an apprenticeship. I get to drive a brand new car and I'm looking to buy my first house. I mean, there is no way that was ever possible before. So I guess I do feel extremely blessed to have been uh, given the opportunities that I have been given. In other school news, an Armstrong High School student accomplished a feat that few students do. He scored a perfect 36 on the ACT. But that score didn't come as a surprise to Ben Aoki Sherwood's teachers. Shannon Slatten has more on this standout student. effects of being alive in 2018. When Ben Aoki Sherwood is in class at Armstrong High School, teachers say he sets the bar high. He exactly matches the answer key on just about every quiz. The sophistication of his writing is really remarkable. The vocabulary he uses for someone his age is amazing. And that's the answer from his AP World History teacher, which is the one class that Ben says he actually needs to study for. History, 
I'll study a little bit more, but science, mostly I can just retain it all. Science is Ben's subject of choice, but he excels at them all. After teaching him for just a few weeks, I'm like, he's going to get a perfect score on the ACT. And Ben did that this spring on his first attempt at taking the ACT. I was happy and I was a little bit surprised, but I had expected to do well. With that rare perfect score under his belt, Ben has the opportunity to chase after whatever dream he wants to pursue. Building and designing rockets would be kind of a dream job for me. And he's dreaming big. Helping people with scientific advances to live better lives as a whole. Ben likes to keep pushing toward his personal best, and you can see that in sports too. Pushing personal and team boundaries to beyond what you thought was possible. Don't be surprised if you hear one day this standout student has discovered something brand new. I like the idea of expanding our human knowledge into the unknown. In Plymouth, Shannon Slatten, CCX News. Well, coming up later, we will check on the longest running social event in Brooklyn Park. But first, let the games begin. Hopkins and Cooper get the baseball season started. John Jacobson has the highlights coming up next. As we told you yesterday, Park Center High School has a new head football coach. Jay Wilcox caught up with the new Pirates leader. Thanks, John. And Jordan Salas is the new head football coach at Park Center. Jordan, congratulations. First of all, tell me about getting the job here at your alma mater. How exciting is it? Thank you, first and foremost. I'm very excited, you know, to be able to be uh, the head coach at my alma mater and where I've spent 11 years as an assistant has just been, I've been over the moon, speechless, just happy and ready to get to work. Was this a goal of yours when you got into coaching to be a head coach? Because uh, not everybody, you know, wants that responsibility. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I was probably 16 years old, junior here, playing football. And, you know, you have so much respect for your coaches and the people who have helped mold you. I never forget, I'll never forget uh, my head coach at the time, Terry Westerman, you know, just how he did the tradition and just how pirate pride was just so important. I, I mean, I think I made my mind up then when I was done playing football, I definitely wanted to be head coach at Park Center. After accepting the job, what are some of the first things that you have to get accomplished to the heading toward that uh, beginning of fall practice? Talking, in, talking to our incoming seniors, we actually had a meeting yesterday and just laying down my criteria and what I, my expectations for them and then just uh, getting out to the BPAA. I think that's huge and what I want for this program, being able to talk to the youth and get those coaches on board with what we're doing at Park Center. Those are the first two things that are very important for me to do. Yeah, I hear it said at this school and pretty much all the schools we cover is that we have some great athletes in our building that aren't coming out for football. How big of a, of a role do the coaches play like in trying to, you know, trying to change that? Uh, we're going to play a huge role. You know, I'm fortunate enough I have, myself included, there's four, four or five coaches that we have in the building. And I'm fortunate enough that I coach another sport and the other guys coach basketball and coach multiple sports. So we're really trying to stay home first, get the kids out, and then go from there. Salas played college football at Northern Iowa after attending Park Center. He's working now on assembling his coaching staff. The Hopkins baseball team has a new turf field for baseball, which will be used for the Section 6-4A playoffs. And it's also nice for seasons like this, playable after a snowy and cold spring. Hopkins hosting Cooper Tuesday in a non-conference game. Bottom of the first inning, Hopkins leadoff hitter Kyle Sherboga ripping the shot to the gap. He'll get all the way to third base for a triple. Then Tommy Off's base hit scores, Curtis runner Hunter Baudre, and it's 1-0 Royals. Bottom of the third inning, Bobby Wilson strokes a hit up the middle. This plates Wyatt Nelson for a 4-0 Hopkins lead. Cooper rallies in the fifth inning. Pedro Ortega laces a two-out hit to score Josh Gabrick and Therese Na Allen, and the lead is cut to 5-4. To Bottom of the fifth, Wilson's fly ball to the right field corner. Drops in and gets away from the Cooper defense, allowing Nelson to score. The Royals are up 6-4, to four, and it starts a big inning. Auth's two-out, bases-loaded hit, scores a couple more runs. It's a five-run frame for the Royals, and they win it over Cooper 10-5. to five. 
Many local softball teams are getting outside this week for the first time as well. At Cooper, the Hawks hosted one of the top teams in the Metro West Conference, the Chaska Hawks, and the snow all gone here as well. Chaska breaks through in this one first. Ronnie Quinn with a hot shot to shortstop. A little bobble here, and it allows Haley Haas to come home from third base, and it's 1-0 Chaska. They go up. 2-0 after the inning. In the second inning, it's Lindsey Moore with a single to center field. Allie Florek scores, and it's 3-0 Chaska. Cooper gets on the board in the bottom of the inning. A delayed double steal, and on the throw down to second base, Jessica Ringo comes in from third to score to make it 3-2. Down 4-3 in the third. Cooper ties it. A slow roller to second base. Chaska gets Ringo out at first on the play, but Emma Freitag scores from third, and that's 4-4. After Chaska got a run in the top of the fourth, Cooper ties it again in the home half of the inning. Laura Beaner with a hit. Maddie McGuire wheels around third base, slides in safely, and Cooper ties the game at five. A Chaska opens up the game in the fifth and sixth inning, scoring six runs total. Moore knocks in two with this single, scoring Lauren Johnson and Florick, and Chaska goes up 11-5. Cooper's not done scoring yet, though. Beaner drives one deep and over the fence in left center for a two-run homer. High-scoring game. A Chaska winning it. 11-7 is the final. That's all for sports. Mike and Alex, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, John. Up next, the Lions are again busy cooking for a hungry crowd. But they're doing it without the man known as the heart and soul of the local club. We'll check on the annual smelt fry when we come back. A small fish is attracting big interest in Brooklyn Park. The world's largest smelt fry organized by the Brooklyn Park Lions is underway. People from the community, you see your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers, it's like a party out there. In fact, it's billed as the longest running social event in Brooklyn Park. The 56th annual Smelt Fry opened with a big hungry crowd at the Community Activity Center on Tuesday night. The process has become a well-oiled machine from applying the batter to dumping about 2,000 pounds of the tiny fish into fryers. They're still following a process designed by the man who first organized the event in the early 1960s. But this year, Art Kwame is absent. He died earlier this year, and the event is named after him. In those days, the guys used to go up to D Duluth, purchase the, the, the smelt in Duluth, bring it back here, clean it for about a week, and out in tents, out in the snow in the early April weather. And they had a lot of fun doing that. I think there was a lot of snops passed around while they were cleaning the smelt. Well, some of those traditions still survive. It's a big fundraiser for the Lions Club, which donates to many charitable causes. Again, the Smelt Fry runs through Friday, starts at 5 o'clock every night now through Friday. You see those signs all over. Amazing, too, that he's been doing it since oh, the 60s. And they are still using some of the equipment that he <laughs> handmade. That's amazing. Decades ago. <laughs> That'll do it. That's it for now. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you back here again on Thursday, starting at 4 o'clock.